to our submissions. So remember way back several months ago now at the end of last, of last year, we had a box out here. I was asking, what do you guys want to hear about? What do you want to talk about? What do you want to spend time on? Let's get back to some of those submissions. We took, we took I think, about two months off for Lent in which we focused on the Lord's Supper and all the different things around that. Um, and now we're getting back to going back to all those different slips and, and requests and, and submissions and ideas and topics and themes and stuff that, that I got from all of you. We're going back to that this morning. A little bit of a refresher for why are we doing this? What's going on here? One of the big things is that there's this idea, there's this expectation that as a church and as God's people, as a preacher, this kind of gets put on me in many ways, that I am preaching the entire, the entire witness, the entire counsel of Scripture. Uh, I am human, just like anybody else, and I've got my favorite topics, and I've got my favorite passages, and I've got my things that I really enjoy talking about, but I, what comes with that is some blind spots. There are inevitably some spots that I am probably missing, some things that you would love to talk about, that you would love to deal with, that you would love to hear about, that I'm just not even thinking about. And so this has helped to kind of give a sense of what do I need to hit, and where have we been missing, kind of missing the mark a little bit. The other thing, the other reason why, the, um, why we're doing this, um, spending 2022 doing this, and, and another really good thing that comes out of this is it's a, a communal slash koinonia aspect to this. You see, what we're talking about and what we're getting into today and what we're going to be getting into in the coming weeks, this is not stuff that I've thought up. This is stuff, these are ideas and these are questions that have come from somebody, from many somebodies sitting in this room right now. And so what that means is that on any given week, on any given Sunday, the topic or the issue that we might deal with or look at, it might not be something that really resonates with you, but it could be the thing that the person sitting right next to you is really, really struggling and wrestling with and wanting to know about. And what that then means is that rather than us just kind of blowing it off and saying, well, this, is, this just isn't important to me, and so I'm not going to pay attention. Instead, what, what I want to see us, what I want to encourage you to do is listen to it and take it in and realize that somebody sitting here needs to hear this. Somebody sitting here needs to wrestle with it. My, my brother, my sister, who's sitting right here, they need, they, need to hear, they need to hear this right now. And so then you can take that and you can go home and you can, you can be praying for your other church family members and brothers and sisters sitting around you. We can be praying for each other and it it helps us to kind of develop and grow in in our sense of community and our sense of togetherness, our sense of unity with one another because we have a better understanding of what are we all kind of thinking about and dealing with and wrestling with and wanting to know about. And where are we, where we, where do we all as individuals, where does somebody sitting in here right now, what do they feel like God is kind of working on them with right now? So those are kind of the two big things about these submissions that as we get back into it, that I just kind of want to put back out there again. We are going to pick this up by looking at the second half of Mark chapter 16. And this is, this, is a, this is a weird one. This is a little bit weird and a little bit strange. Last week I made a comment. I said, I would be actually surprised if anybody in here has ever heard a sermon on the second half of chapter 16. Now, maybe one or two of you, maybe you have at some point in your church life. But Matthew, Mark 16, Mark 16, not Matthew, Mark 16, Mark 16, the second half here, nine, verses 9 to 20, it presents a weird problem. It presents a really weird issue for us as believers and for the church as a whole and when it comes to the Bible, because if you were to open up your Bibles, which I'm, I'm sure every single buddy is already, every, every, every one of you here has already done that. Mark 16, just before or right in between verse 8 and verse 9, there's a note that has been inserted into most Bibles. And for most Bibles, most, most versions, most translations, they, um, all these verses from 9 to 20 are actually in usually a different font. Maybe it's italicized. Maybe it's slightly smaller print. There's something different about it. And the note that was inserted in there in between 8 and 9, mine says, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 to 20. And so one of the questions, one of the big questions that comes up with Mark 16, and there's a handful of other passages that do the same thing, is this question of, does this stuff even belong in the Bible? Why are we even paying attention to it? Why are we even looking at it? Because the translators themselves are kind of suggesting, well, you know what? It, 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 yeah, we, we don't know. It, it, it may not 
I, we don't know what to do with it. This touches on an aspect of Bible translation that can get really, really, really academic and really technical. I'm going to try and give you a very, very, very surfacey level explanation to that question real quick before we really dive into the text. And where it comes from is, is this reality that Bible translation despite how we all want to think about it, Bible translation, the work of Bible translation is a really pretty messy business. It's not as cut and dry and clear cut and black and white as most of us would love to have it. Now, not a whole lot of ministers, I don't think, would even acknowledge that because you say that, you start saying that, and now there's this risk that there might be some of you now thinking, well, why should I even pay any attention to the Bible anyways then? If we can't really be sure about what exactly we're translating and reading, why should we pay any attention? It's not really that. In fact, the Bible, out of all the ancient documents and all the ancient writings that we have that exist, that we know about it, as human beings, the Bible has come under more scrutiny than any other ancient document or manuscript in existence. It has been studied and has been torn apart and it's been ripped apart more than anything else. And one of the things Time Magazine, probably about 15 years ago, did a story on this and what they came, and what they came to, what they pointed out is that every time somebody dives into the Bible, and starts trying to rip it apart and figuring out how reliable is the Bible really. Every single time the Bible comes out with its integrity, with its reliability, with its truth, all of that even more secure and even more intact than it was before it started to be researched and studied. And it doesn't matter if it's a Christian studying it. It doesn't matter if it's an atheist studying it, trying to find ways to tear it apart. Every single solitary time somebody has dug in to try and verify how much can we really trust the Bible. It always comes out by saying, nah, this is hands down the most reliable ancient manuscript and document that we have. There is more evidence backing this up than any other ancient documents that we have that, that exist in the world. So Bible translation is kind of messy. And oftentimes the way it gets done is you're looking at these tiny little scraps of, of parchment of paper that can range anywhere from the size of a quarter to about the size of a, of, of a napkin. And they have words and they have letters on them and they're in Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew and all these other weird languages. And you're taking it and you're piecing all these scraps of paper together like a jigsaw puzzle until you come out with a Bible. That's kind of how all this stuff works. We have hundreds of thousands of these little scraps in our possession that we have found and that have been discovered. And these hundreds of thousands of little scraps date from the first and second centuries. We also have full, complete collections of documents that date from the third century. Okay, Bible originates in the first century, early first half, middle of the first century. The two big rules when it comes to this kind of work is the older the document, the older the little scrap of paper, the better, because that gets you closer to the originals, which means there's less time for mistakes to be introduced, for things to get changed and all that kind of stuff. The older, the better, but also when it comes to these collections, there are certain collections that are considered to be more reliable than others because we know the rule that were employed to create those collections, the rules around copying and, and how much attention to detail they gave and all of that kind of stuff. For Mark 16, for Mark 16 and other passages like it, the issue that we have is that we don't have a single first and second century scrap that contains any part of verses 9 through 20, which means we don't have any of the oldest stuff that backs us up. But the most reliable collections do have it. And the thinking is that these collections would not have it if there was not evidence, if there was not some source material prior that backed it up and contained it. So that's where it is. So these two big rules of Bible translation were kind of conflict with each other. Now that is as, as weird and as crazy and as deep and academic as that sounded, that is very, very surfacey level for how all this stuff ultimately kind of works out and plays out. But that's, that's the answer. That's what's going on here. That's where that note comes from. The point of it all ultimately comes down to for 1,700 years, the church has accepted verses 9 to 20 as legitimate, inspired scripture. So we can spend time with it. When you get to these parts, when you get to other sections that have this note, you can read them with confidence that the church at least for 1,700 years has accepted and embraced and understood that this is part of inspired scripture. This is part of the Bible. We're just recognizing 
that things are a little weird here with this section in terms of how we got it. All right, that said, let's dive into Mark 16. Mark 16, verse 9. We are back at Easter Sunday. That is the overall context of what is happening here. Mark's, Mark, the book of Mark, the original ending as it is oftentimes referred to as, ends with Jesus appearing to the women at the tomb and all of a sudden everybody takes off and everybody's afraid. And then we pick up at verse 9. Mark 16, verse 9. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. She went and told them what she had seen. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. So it's Easter Sunday. We're hearing typical Easter Sunday stuff. We've heard this, this some version of this from the other gospels before, that Mary Magdalene shows up at the tomb the, the stone isn't there. The tomb is empty. She has this, this, this experience. Jesus shows up and appears before her. So she's convinced Jesus is alive. She takes off, finds the other disciples, the 11, because Judas is out of the picture now. She finds the disciples and she tells them what she's seen. We've been talking about stories. Wendy was talking about, we're talking about stories today. And so much of that is what's going on here. We're talking about stories and telling stories. They, she goes back to the disciples and she tells her story. I have seen Jesus. He's alive. And the disciples say, no, we don't believe it. That's impossible. That's what it says there in verse 11. And draws some attention. Mark, or whoever wrote this part of Mark, draws attention to that. It says, they did not believe it. It's impossible. There's no way that Jesus could be alive. We, we can't believe it. It's too hard. It's too hard to wrap our heads around. Verse 12. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These are the two guys on the road to Emmaus. This is the story that we actually talked about on Easter Sunday. That's where this is coming from. He appeared to these two guys who were walking on a road in the country. They returned after they realized who Jesus was. They returned and they reported to the rest, to the rest of the disciples. They reported to them. But then verse 13 at the very end there. But they did not believe them either. There's a pattern that's starting to come up in this text, in this story here. There's a pattern that's starting to develop that the disciples now, they've now heard from multiple people, multiple different experiences of people coming to them and saying, Jesus is alive. We have seen him. We've walked with him. We've talked with him. We've eaten with him. We, we, we've seen him with our own eyes. He's alive. And the disciples are saying, nah, we can't believe it. We, we, we don't believe it. It's impossible. It can't, it can't be true. It can't be true. 14. Later, Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. And hear, hear this. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So Jesus, I imagine Jesus thinking to himself, all right, y'all still don't get it. You still don't believe, all right? I'll show you myself. I'm going to show up in front of you. I'm going to show myself to you. I'm just going to show up. And we know from one of the other gospels that the disciples were sitting at this point. They were sitting in a room. The doors were locked. They were afraid of, uh, of the Jews and of the Romans and of all the other people around because of conspiracy theories about, about missing bodies and all kinds of other stuff. And so the doors were locked and they were, they were very much kind of locked in, in this really kind of safe, protected space. And all of a sudden Jesus shows up right there in the room with them. It's like, there's Jesus. And not like a ghost, not like this weird little mist thing walking through doors or anything. Jesus is there physically with them. And this is, what, this is what's going on here at this point in Mark 16. And Jesus shows up and here he is now standing in front of a group of people who up to this point keep saying, I don't believe. And he calls them out for it. He calls them out for their lack of belief. And, and he calls them out and he says, look, this is not just this is not just kind of one of these things where you see something incredible, where you see something amazing, and you're not really sure if you could trust your eyes or not. It's not just sort of one of these things like, yeah, you know what, I'm not, I'm not buying it. I'm not sure that this is really what's going on. It's not that. It says that Jesus rebukes them for their stubborn refusal to believe. What the disciples are at, what, this, what the disciples are doing right now at this point, what's going on is that this, this is an active disbelief. A stubborn refusal to believe, that's not just sort of a, I just haven't been convinced yet. This is a, I refuse to believe it. 
I refuse to, to accept this story. I refuse to, to, to acknowledge and believe that what I'm being told is true. And I usually, usually when somebody is in that position with Jesus, it tends not to work out very well for them. All right, that's, that's not a place that you want to be. You don't want to be in that place where you are just flat out stubbornly refusing to believe something about Jesus or something that Jesus is doing and something that Jesus is at work doing in your life. But there's, and that, that, that's, a big, that's a big issue. That's a big issue and that's a big deal. But I can't help when I look at Mark 16, I look at these verses and I start to see some patterns kind of starting to play out here. And we'll see more of this as we keep going through this text. There's, there's another issue at work here. Perhaps maybe even the bigger issue of what Mark is getting at over and above the, 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 lack, of, the lack of belief in the resurrection for Mark here. See, the disciples, if you notice, the disciples are not refusing to believe that Jesus is their Savior. Who Jesus is, that's not what they are refusing to believe. They're not, they, they still believe that Jesus is the Savior. They still believe that Jesus is the Messiah. What they are rejecting, what they are refusing to believe, is they are refusing to believe and they are rejecting God's power and God's ability to make good on what he had promised would take place. You go back through the Gospels, all four of them, and over and over and over again, prior to the crucifixion, Jesus is clear that, look, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die, but then I'm going to come back. This is the disciples actively refusing to believe, actively rejecting God's power, God's omnipotence. We talked about that a couple months ago, God's omnipotence. They are refusing to believe and to trust in God's faithfulness, in his perfect faithfulness to make good and to keep and to uphold his promises. He promised that things were going to happen. And they're saying, no, we refuse to believe that these things actually did happen. Now, what does all this have to do with the Great Commission? Because that was the question that came to me. It's like, hey, let's talk about the Great Commission in Mark 16. What does all this have to do with the Great Commission? Well, as it relates to Mark and where Mark is going to go here in a second, Mark's version of the Great Commission puts a heavy emphasis on trusting and believing that God is all-powerful and that he is perfectly faithful. Each of the Gospels has their own little twist on the Great Commission. Mark's twist is that all of this sits, the key to being a Great Commission Christian, we might say, is fully believing in God's power and his faithfulness to work through you. So Mark's Great Commission. Let's jump into that. And here's where things start to get a little bit weird with this section here. Verse 15, so Jesus said to the disciples, after rebuking them, Jesus said to the disciples, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Pretty standard Great Commission stuff. The words themselves that we hear, the words that, that Jesus is reported to say here, it's, it's exactly the same as we hear in Matthew and exactly what we hear in Luke, exactly what we hear in Acts. And we're just, we're just hearing the same words all over again right here. So it's all pretty basic Great Commission stuff. Jesus says, look, you believe that I'm the Messiah. You believe that I died for your sins. You believe that I am the Savior. Now, 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 and now you see that the stories about my resurrection are true. So now here's what you do with that. Here's what you do with that. Now that you believe, now that you see for yourself, here's what you do with that. Here's where you go with that. I'm going to trust and I'm going to make an assumption here that, that most of us, we have heard the Great Commission. We've heard the Great Commission talked about enough that I don't need to dig too deep. I don't need to go too deep into the role of the Great Commission in our life, in the life of a believer. I don't need to really dig into that too much. And Mark doesn't really dig too deeply into that either because it, it, it's a fairly easy, in many ways, easy concept concept to grasp. But there is a real rubber hits the road issue going on here that Mark is really drawing out. When it comes to our relationship, when it comes to your relationship with the Great Commission, the real rubber hits the road issue that Mark is pulling out 
is a question of what holds you back. You know what the Great Commission is. You know what it's asking. You know what God expects. You know, what, you know what's there. But what holds you back? What holds any of us back from actually living it and doing it? Now, humor me. Not that you have much of a choice because I'm the one up here and you're sitting there unless you all decide to get up and walk out. But humor me for a second here because I'm, I'm going to venture a guess about something when it comes to what holds us back with the Great Commission. What I often hear, and I've used these excuses myself before too, what I often hear is, well, I need more training or I... Um, I don't have enough opportunity. I don't know enough non-Christians. I don't know where to go. I, so I, I, don't, I, I, I need more training. I, I, need, I, I don't have enough know-how to do it. I, I need somebody to come. I need to do a, let's do a, let's do an evangelism seminar or something and, and teach us how to talk to our neighbors. Or, or I just, I, I, oh, my entire world, is, it's wrapped up, in, okay, it's wrapped up in, in Christian circles, whether it's Bible studies or, or church life and church activities or, or parachurch organizations that you volunteer with or the Christian school or, or whatever. Whatever it is, all my friends, all my family, everybody around me are Christians, and so I don't, I don't have the opportunity to do it, and so I can't. How am I supposed to do the Great Commission? Those are the things. Those are the things that I probably most commonly and most frequently hear about. Well, this is why. This is where things are breaking down. I just, I just don't know how to do it, or I don't have, I don't know where to go. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But the, but the real issue. The real issue as to why things start to break down, as to why we might not do Great Commission stuff, and this is the guess that I'm venturing to take, the real issue is fear of failure. It's not that, it's not that we don't have enough training. It's not that we don't have enough opportunity, because the second you walk out this door and stop off the grocery store, you have an opportunity. It's not that we lack any of that. It's that... We are afraid of failing at the Great Commission. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that's wrapped up even just in that as well. And here's what's so great about this weird little passage in Mark. Jesus goes after the jugular of fear. Jesus goes straight after that jugular of fear of failure when it comes to the Great Commission. Verse uh, where we leave off. Verse 17. And these signs, these are the things that will accompany those who do believe, who do believe that I'm the Messiah, who do believe that I've risen from the dead. Here are the signs. Here are the things that are going to happen to and through the people who do believe and do respond and do go out into the world and do the Great Commission. In my name, in my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. The interesting thing about that is if you go back into the book of Acts, every single one of those things happens in the book of Acts. There's a story about every single one of those things mentioned. Even the weird stuff like playing with snakes. Even that happens in the book of Acts. Not really playing with snakes, but somebody gets bit by a snake and doesn't die. There are stories, all these stories happen in the book of Acts. And when Jesus is saying and giving this list, what I'm looking at is this list and what I see in this list, I'm thinking, man, this is all a bunch of really incredibly scary and incredibly intimidating and incredibly dangerous stuff. This is the kind of stuff that so often for us, for many of us, we're like, that, no, that's, that's too dangerous. That's too out there. That's too out in that field. I don't want to get involved with that. I don't want to get messed up with that. I want to stay here where it's a little bit safer. I will do the Great Commission, but God, you got to bring somebody 
knocking on my door and asking about my church, which has happened. I've heard the stories, all right? You got to bring, you got to make it like that because I don't want to go out and, and get myself, and get myself like into a dangerous spot where all of a sudden I'm going to be casting out demons and playing with rattlesnakes. This is too far. And Jesus says, no, you know what? If you believe, if you trust me, if you, if you believe that I'm the Savior, but that I'm also, that I've also risen, if you have had this personal encounter with me, this is the type of stuff that is going to happen. This is the sort of stuff that God is going to do through you. Because all these intimidating and incredibly dangerous things are happening because somebody believes and has embraced the God's incredible and dangerous power and faithfulness to be able to do them. And here's the thing, to be able to do things like this plus so much more. Jesus is giving us examples. He's not necessarily expecting you to cast out demons, to play with rattlesnakes or talk in tongues. He might. That starts to get more into your individual kind of thing and what, what, what is God doing with you as a person. He is simply asking you to trust him enough and trust his power enough to be willing to share and talk about your story. Just like Mary Magdalene, just like the two people walking along on the road, just like the disciples when Jesus showed up, to just, just simply say, I have seen Jesus. He is alive. He has come into my life, and he is here, and he is moving. And we get afraid because what happens is we start to put all this pressure on ourselves, and we tend to look at the Great Commission as a job description or, or some sort of form for like professional assessment kind of a thing, a professional evaluation or a job evaluation. And if we don't do the job right, then we're going to get fired. And what Jesus is saying, he's saying, look, here's the call. Now, here's the promise that goes along with it. And do you believe? Do you believe in my power? Do you trust in the power? Do you trust that I am powerful enough to do all of these really big, weird, crazy, dangerous things through you? Do you trust my promises? When I promise and I say, I will do this, all you have to do is tell your story. All you have to do is tell people about your encounter with me. Leave the rest up to me. Just tell your story. Just tell your story. Verse 19, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven. He sat at the right hand of God. And verse 20 is one that I really want you to pay attention to. Then the disciples went out and they preached everywhere. And look at this. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it, by the signs that accompanied their preaching, that accompanied their storytelling. They did their job, they saw Jesus. They had an encounter with him. They heard the words and the invitation. They finally got to a point where they were able to say, you know what? I believe Jesus was my savior, but now, now I see the full breadth of the power of God at work because now here is the risen Lord standing in front of me. God is all powerful. God is perfectly faithful to the promises that he makes. And what else has he promised? He has promised to continue to use his power to do all this other stuff, all I have to do is tell my story. And you see the disciples, they say, they went out and they started to tell their story everywhere. And in telling their story, the Lord worked with them and confirmed through their faithfulness. The Lord's power, God's power showed up and was displayed through the disciples simply because they were willing to share their story. That's it. That's it. Every one of the Gospels has, puts their own twist in many ways on the Great Commission. Matthew tends to, I tend to see Matthew's twist, Matthew's emphasis as being on discipleship. I tend to see Luke's emphasis when he talks about the Great Commission as really being on the mission aspect of going out into the world and just get out in the world. Get out, get out, get out. As far as you can go, you just, just go. 
John, I tend to see John as, as really emphasizing forgiveness, the fact that we are forgiven because of Jesus and we have been redeemed and reconciled and brought together to, with God through Jesus. Mark, Mark is driving home the power of God. And it's promising. God is promising his power and his work and his faithfulness to those who believe and are willing to tell their story. Training is not training is not what is needed. That's that's a way of getting out of things. We say, "Why well, just need more training?" You know, I, I have a friend who went to school for like ten years and came out with an associate and a bachelor's in ten years. We kept joking around that he was a professional student, and it's like you just you just you just keep going to school so that you can get out of actually getting a job. That, that's all it is. We that's kind of like what it's like when we say we just need more training. Training is not the issue. It's not what we need in order to go out into the world with the gospel. All the best training in the world, all the best equipping, all the best open doors and opportunities in the world, minus the power and the faithfulness of God, still equals zero. The worst training plus the power of God is everything. The only way that anyone can truly fail in the Great Commission is by being like the disciples and stubbornly refusing to believe and the power and the promise of God. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, is one final kind of confirmation reminder. It says that it is God, it is God who works in you. It is God who works in you in order to fulfill his good purposes. It is God who does the work. You just tell your story. Perfect.